Hello and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we will be discussing the uh, ongoing crisis in Syria. And now it's widely believed that the regime has used chemical and biological weapons uh, against its own people. Uh, we'll be asking, will this lead to Western military intervention in Syria uh, now that uh, President Obama last August drew the red lines in which he said that if the regime uses chemical or biological weapons, this will be a red line. So we'll be asking, how will the West respond and how is the civil war in Syria uh, affecting Israel and what are Israel's concerns? Plus, we'll be discussing the plight of Christians caught up in this conflict. And uh, today's guest for the program is Professor Alan Johnson. He's the editor of Fathom magazine and is also a senior research fellow at uh, Bicom. Alan, it's great to have you on the Middle East Report and uh, thank you for coming with such short notice. So very much appreciated. Um, can you share with us, our viewers, something about your background and how you got involved in the work of the Middle East and, and being an analyst and a, a, a researcher? Well, um I suppose there's personal, political and professional reasons. But personally, I had a, a low church Protestant background. I can still remember the days when um, I was surprised when the Psalms weren't ours, so to speak. Uh, that surprised me. Um, so I suppose that's, that's part of the mix. Um, politically, I was a student activist on the left. And we worked very closely with the Union of Jewish Students in the 1980s to prevent the banning of Jewish societies. Some students had got it into their heads that because the United Nations said Zionism is racism and student unions had no platform for racist policies, they somehow got to the position where they were trying to ban Jewish societies. So we worked closely with UJS and that was an important experience for me over four or five years. Professionally, I was an academic. I, I taught the Holocaust for, for, for many years. And my inaugural uh, lecture as a professor was the, the thought of Primo Levi, the, the Auschwitz survivor. Interesting. And uh, you're also now working as the editor of Father magazine. Yes. Which looks like a very impressive uh, glossy magazine and also uh, Bicom as well, which is a very prominent uh, Jewish organization in, uh, in London. Sure. Fathom is a new magazine. It's uh, issue three is about to come out soon. Um, it's the uh, thinking behind Fathom is that a lot of debate about Israel in the UK is very simplistic, as a megaphone war with two sides shout at each other, and people don't really understand um, Fathom very clear uh, Israel very clearly. The idea of Fathom is the, the most expert voices, the most interesting voices from Israel and also from the UK will talk about the real dilemmas in Israel, the real Israel, Israel in 3D, we talk about it. So we're trying to put together, the idea is the, uh, the authority of an old school journal, very high scholarly standards with the, the newest technology. So you can download this for free from your, on your iPad or your iPhone together with the social networks. So this is all free and you can take it, you can cut and paste, you can send it to anyone, email it to anyone and pass the word around. And we've had a very, nice. very strong reaction so far. Excellent. So I think uh, I can just see the uh, the banners up now. So any of our viewers who want to actually get a copy of the Fa uh, Fathom magazine, it's uh, free. You can do that by going to the website. And also there's uh, an app, isn't there, that uh, our viewers can download from sure. iTunes. Sure. Just go to iTunes and it's all for free. It takes a few minutes. Okay. Excellent. And can you also tell us about the important work being carried out uh, by Bicom because you're a senior research fellow at Bicom? Sure. BICOM is the Britain Israel Research and Communication Centre. We've been going 11 years. We have offices in London and in Jerusalem. Our job is to create a more supportive environment for Israel in the UK. The way we do that is to create better understanding of Israel in the UK. So we take journalists over on delegations to, to Israel and introduce them to a range of Israeli voices so they can improve their knowledge and understanding and come back and hopefully write reports with more nuance and, and more, more knowledge. We also regularly brief journalists and politicians and opinion formers in the UK about the latest developments uh, in, in Israel. We have a grassroots organization called We Believe in Israel, which I think you've had Luke Akest on your program Absolutely. before. Yes. Luke is the director of our We believe and does some sterling work, for instance, trying to resist the boycott, divestments and sanctions movement against Israel, which aims to turn Israel into a, a pariah state. So we have We Believe, we have BICOM doing its work with uh, opinion formers, and we have Fathom doing the um, what we sometimes call the battle of ideas amongst the intellectuals, the academics and, um, and, and the co commentariat. Excellent. Uh, and today we're discussing the ongoing crisis in Syria, which, according to UN reports, has claimed the death of more than 70,000 Syrians, also created a, a mass uh, 
uh, Exodus problem in which, uh, was it 1.5 million Syrians have, have fled the country into neighboring Turkey or into Jordan. Um, and the situation doesn't seem like it's anywhere close to any to being resolved. Um, how did this, can you give us the historic overview to this uh, crisis in Syria? Well, I think what we're looking at in the, in the Middle East is, it, is the collapse of two great projects and the emergence of two new projects. The, the projects that are collapsing, the first is the post-World War I European division of the, of the region with those straight lines. You see many countries in the Middle East with straight lines. That's because Europeans drew them on maps in the aftermath of World War I. To some extent, these were artificial nations. That, that settlement is, is breaking up in the context of the, the Arab Spring. The second project, which is really coming to its, its, its death throes now, is secular Arab nationalism of various kinds, whether it was communist, Ba'athist in the form of um, Saddam Hussein and Assad, or, or other forms. And these projects are really um, fading away. The projects that are emerging, one is led by Iran, it's a Shia-led project, and it thinks of itself as the resistance, the resistance to the West and the resistance to Israel. Iran's idea is to include a pro-Iranian space, really, from Afghanistan to the Mediterranean, and it will take in Iran, Iraq, which is now a Sunni majority state with Maliki in control, increasingly drawn towards Iran, through Syria into Lebanon, where Iran's proxy, Hezbollah, is dominant. So that's one project. The second project is various forms of Sunni extremism. Now, the most extreme, obviously, being Al-Qaeda's global jihad project, but then we go through the Salafists, the very literalist and sometimes very violent Islamist organizations. We then go through the various forms of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is increasingly dominant in the region, through to organizations such as the AKP in Turkey and under Erdogan. So we can't lump them all in together. It's a very complicated picture. But they're the two projects. Where the two projects meet this conflict. So there's a line now runs right through the Middle East from Bahrain through Iraq, through Lebanon, and now into Syria, where, the, where those two projects meet, we see a crisis. So far from Israel, as some people think being the heart and soul of every problem in the region, and if we could only create peace, everything would be sorted out. There's an, there's an extent to which Israel is actually a, a sideshow the conflict there is a sideshow compared to this, these tectonic plates which are now shifting in the region and creating these two big blocks which are, uh, when they bump up against each other, there, there's blood and there's conflict. Uh, Alan, uh, are we not seeing what's happening in, in Syria is uh, pretty much a conflict between the Islamic Republic of Iran who wants to keep Bashar al-Assad in power as the proxy state of the uh, Iranian regime um, together with forces such as the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, Sunni al-Qaeda forces that are supported by the Turks, the Saudis, the Egyptians who want to see Assad's regime overthrown and how much does so much of this Sunni resentment um, uh, play into the picture in terms of the fact that Bashar al-Assad and his regime are Alawites, which represent uh, 8 to 10 percent of the population in Syria. And uh, if we remember back to um, Assad's father, uh, Faisal Assad, in 1982, in which he massacred over 20,000 people in Homs, do you think this is playing into old wounds and old conflicts, which is really adding fuel to the flames uh, in, in Syria in this civil war? You're yeah, right. We, we almost seem to have the worst of all worlds in Syria. We have a very violent regime which is willing to inflict tr tremendous um, slaughter upon the Syrian people to survive. We also have an ethnic and sectarian and religious conflict. That's what the conflict actually is. We also have a kind of Cold War situation in which various outside actors are fully involved, stirring the pot. So it's tremendously difficult to see how this conflict comes to an end. There's a kind of stalemate existing at the moment. The Assad regime is based on the Alawites, which I think are around 12% or so of the country. They have their own strongholds on the Mediterranean coast. But they have international backers. They have backing from Russia, they have backing from Iran, and they have backing from the Hezbollah militias very actively and very, very well armed and very well organized and good fighters, actually. So Assad is not going anywhere quickly. On the other hand, the rebels have more people. The Sunnis represent well over 60% of the population, so they have a much more of a, a wide popular base than the Assad regime has. And they have the, their own backers, as you say, from the Sunni, the Gulf states, and the big Sunni powers in the region. And at the moment, 
that stalemate, the Assad regime is trying to end the tie, so to speak, between the two sides by using more and more potent weaponry. So the use of artillery, then the use of airstrikes, and now it seems very likely we're seeing the beginning of the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime to try and break the tie between his regime and the rebels. Mm. And we've got a clip to go to now. Uh, it's entitled uh, Syria War, the uh, Truth Behind the Conflict. Turmoil in Syria has been the longest and bloodiest of any of the Arab Spring uprisings. What started in March 2011 with a handful of street protests has descended into a civil war that has left thousands dead. The first spark of rebellion came in the town of Dara when a handful of young Syrians were arrested for writing graffiti calling for the fall of President Bashar Assad's regime. Just a month later, protests spread across the country and the Syrian army cracked down in response, posting snipers and shelling neighborhoods. The conflict would eventually spread to major Syrian cities like Damascus, Aleppo, Homs, Hama, and many more. Some soldiers defected and created the Free Syrian Army, the largest armed opposition force challenging Assad. And a refugee crisis emerged and has accelerated with intensified fighting as thousands of Syrians flee to neighboring countries. Sectarian divisions play a role in this conflict. The opposition is mostly Sunni Muslim, a majority of the population in Syria. Christians have given soft support for the regime, largely out of fear that the rebels may try to establish an Islamic state if the Assad government falls. The Druze, an offshoot of Islam that largely live in the Israeli annexed Golan Heights, share similar fears. Kurds in northern Syria have remained on the sidelines, maintaining autonomy much as Iraqi Kurds did during the war in Iraq. Members of the Alawite sect, an offshoot of Shia Islam, dominate the Assad regime, many top military posts, and a band of militias called the Shabiha which many believe are responsible for some of the most heinous massacres against Syrian civilians. Both the Arab League and the United Nations have failed on multiple occasions to implement a peace plan. The Assad regime is emboldened by its strongest allies. Iran's connection is mostly religious, as it holds a Shiite majority and Syria is one of the few fellow Shiite governments in the Middle East. Syria's connections with Russia and China are economic, as the country imports weapons and a wide range of other goods. Many diplomats also believe Russia and China hold onto their alliance with Syria as a buffer against American influence in the region. Russia and China have veto power on the UN Security Council and have used their votes to scuttle three UN resolutions to put pressure on the Syrian regime. Both countries worry the UN might enforce a resolution with a military response. After the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, many worry that Syria could devolve into a protracted regional conflict with no clear idea of what a future Syrian government might look like if Assad were ousted. It's hard to know when or how this conflict may end, and further bloodshed seems to be the only certainty. Welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Um, Alan, we, we saw in that clip, really, which I think explained very, very well the complexities involved in, in this conflict. Is there not a great danger that what's happening in Syria could actually overflow into neighboring states and we could end up, this could lead to a, a, a regional war or a wider conflict? Certainly the, the conflict is already beginning to spill beyond its borders in various ways. The, the, the first and most obvious is the humanitarian catastrophe, which is, as you say, well over a million refugees now. And they're putting pressure on the states to which they go to. Jordan, for instance, which already had a lot of economic difficulties, is now really making some desperate pleas for aid and support to, to cope with the hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees which are in Jordan. We're also looking at the danger of a, loose, a loosening, a spilling outwards of chemical and biological weapons and also just some major sophisticated weaponry that isn't chemical and biological such as sur surface-to-air missiles and so on, air defences and so on. We're looking at the danger of that leaking outwards in particular towards Hezbollah, the uh, Iranian proxy force in Lebanon and to other terrorist groups. Israel is very concerned about that. It's already conducted one strike on what was very probably surface-to-air missiles, or air defense uh, missiles, which were looked like they were in transit from Syria to Lebanon. And it's declared its willingness to do so if that should happen again. In terms of the Shia fighting quality, yes, already there are refugees moving from Syria into Lebanon. Sometimes they are Sunni refugees and they're clashing with the Shiite Hezbollah militias inside Lebanon. We have Shiite Hezbollah militias moving the other way, coming to fight in a, in a very determined way for the Assad regime, and they're clashing with some of the rebel forces. So there's, there's a real possibility of a spread of the conflict over into Lebanon. Mm. And um, 
What are, what are, what are your views on uh, the news that occurred this week, really, that um, Hezbollah's leader, Nasrallah, has said that uh, he's willing to back up uh, Assad's regime? Isn't this going to cause an even greater tension, not only in Syria amongst the rebel um, Sunni forces, but also in uh, Lebanon itself, knowing that Hezbollah has political representation in, in the Lebanese parliament? Yes, it's interesting, isn't it, how um, Assad's backers have been absolutely rock solid for him so far. Iran has not budged at all. Um, the, the slaughter of ten, tens of thousands um, of Muslims has not seemingly affected Iran's support. And Hezbollah has declared uh, uh, very recently its uh, rock solid support also. And this is one of the reasons Assad is able to survive in that the other Arab regimes in the region which fell tended not to have these lines of support outside of the country. They tended to be identified with the West to some extent and being pro-American to some extent. So when their moment came, they found they didn't have the backers. That's really not the case with Assad. Assad has identified himself with Iran, with the so-called resistance to the West, and so he has these relationships which your clip showed, which he's able to draw upon. Now, Lebanon is, is a country which in the past has undergone civil war which is a very delicate ethnic and political mix. Its political system is, is geared up to represent very carefully in the constitution, this is written down, which ethnic groups will be represented in which ways, in which positions in politics. So it's, it's, it's always on the edge of fearing a tip back into ethnic conflict. This is one of the dangers that the Syrian civil war poses to Lebanon is that it's going to tip over back into a, a conflict itself. There's no sign of that happening at the moment, but it's a real, it's a real potential there. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now. It's entitled, uh, Nasrallah says, Syria has uh, real friends in the region. It just reinforces what uh, Alan is saying on this program today. The leader of Hezbollah, Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, has given the strongest indication yet that his Iranian-backed militant group is ready to get fully involved in Syria's civil war on the side of President Bashar al-Assad. Nasrallah said that Assad's regime would not be defeated by the rebel opposition and that Syria had, quote, real friends in the region who would not allow Syria to fall into the hands of America or Israel. Nasrallah also commented on accusations that Assad's regime had used chemical weapons, saying that the allegations were an attempt to justify foreign intervention in Syria. In the past, both Hezbollah and Iran have been accused by rebels of sending fighters to help Syrian troops trying to crush the uprising. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. Alan, we know pretty much the uh, nature and the makeup of uh, those who are supporting President Bashar al-Assad, particularly Hezbollah, the uh, Islamic uh, Shia terrorist organization based in, in southern Lebanon. And also we know that uh, there are a strong presence of Iranian revolutionary guards um, that are propping up Assad's regime in Syria and fighting against the rebels. But we're not really sure of the makeup of the rebel forces. Um, hearing media reports, there's a strong al-Qaeda element. Um, can you kind of clarify us? Uh, to, to our viewers, what is the makeup of the uh, the opposition forces that are opposing President Assad? It's a confused picture, and we're not the only ones finding trouble in working out exactly what the political complexion of the opposition is. Foreign ministries around the world are having the same trouble, and they have intelligence forces trying working night and day to work this out. America, for instance, would like to identify a moderate, pro-Western, even liberal elements to the opposition and to, to back them financially and possibly in time with lethal weaponry. It would like to do that. One of the troubles it has is, is gauging how influential those more moderate elements are and whether any weapons handed over to them would be immediately taken off them by more dominant forces. And I think what we can say is there are more dominant forces in the opposition of two kinds, really. I would say, yes, you're right, there are al-Qaeda forces there, and um, Israeli security officials have been talking about the significance of the presence of al-Qaeda forces. Now, when we say al-Qaeda, we don't necessarily mean close personal associates of al-Zawahiri and, 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 and so on. 
we're talking about Al-Qaeda affiliated organizations. And those affiliations can be very close or, or more distant. Some people can identify themselves as taking their orders from or being very influenced by the ideas of Al-Qaeda. Others could be simply in the general area of a global jihadist, anti-Western, and so on. But, but those forces are present. There's been some reports, for instance, of Al-Qaeda affiliated groups wandering around the Golan Heights area, border area, videoing IDF soldiers, putting them on YouTube. And it's not so much that they currently represent a great threat militarily to Israel, it's the dynamic that people worry about. An incident on the border, which could be portrayed regionally as the Israeli state against um, Muslim fighters, could quickly draw in more significant actors, including state actors, and then we're in a situation we really don't want to be in. So Israel's keeping a very close eye on that Golan border. It's trying to deter any military threats coming over the border, but it's also trying not to get itself entangled in that. So they're, they're two of the forces we've looked at, the, the, the moderate liberal forces and the uh, al-Qaeda forces. The impression I get from talking to analysts who've been back and forward to the region, including Jonathan Spire from the Gloria Center, who was a very good analyst of the region. I mean, Jonathan says that down the middle is brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood style forces, Islamist forces, Islamist fighters who are, who are more influential. His advice is to keep an eye on those forces for any post Assad settlement, not, not the you know, Chechens who've come to fight for something they call al-Qaeda and, and sadly not, not the, the, the moderate forces. I mean, sadly, uh, this conflict uh, in Syria has gone on now for um, over two years. Uh, like I said at the beginning of the program, has claimed the lives of more than 70,000 uh, Syrians and uh, has produced uh, 1.5 million refugees. Um, and there is reluctance on the part of the West to actually intervene in this conflict, unlike uh, the British and the French during the uh, crisis in Libya, which removed Colonel Gaddafi from power. Um, now it's believed, according to Israeli intelligence, which is backed up by US intelligence and also reported by the Times uh, of London, that um, Assad's regime has used chemical and biological weapons, particularly uh, sarin gas, which is absolutely horrific on his own people. Um, this only emboldens, for example, the Republican parties to actually put more pressure on President Obama to take action. Um, what are the implications for the United States um, and the West if, if Obama does not take action? Well, what, what we know so far, this is from UK intelligence and Israeli intelligence, and I think American intelligence now accepts this is the case. Obama gave a press conference yesterday in which he appeared to accept that chemical weapons have been used. We have, at the moment, the newspapers this morning are talking about uh, Turkey is having refugees coming over the border into Turkey from Syria with breathing difficulties. They're treating them in hospitals, hospitals which they are first sealing off, and the staff in those hospitals are wearing special suits in order to treat them. This is, this is desperately serious. What Obama is saying at the moment is, we don't necessarily know who used the weaponry and whether it was intentional and what the chain of responsibility is back to the regime. Now, it's, we could look at that in two different ways. If you want to be charitable, we could say that that is a case of Obama doing due diligence and being very prudential and careful about assigning blame. He himself says, look, I'm operating in an environment in which, you know, there was widespread understanding that Saddam had chemical weapons, weapons of mass destruction. The Western intelligence agency seems to say that he did. And there's skepticism as a result that we didn't find them. Doesn't mean they weren't there, by the way, but it, we didn't find them. So that's that he's operating politically in that backdrop so that's the case on the other hand there's many people who say this is worrying that america hasn't taken more decisive action and had a more decisive response to the use of chemical weapons israel for instance has a lot of um you know store by does america stand by its declared red lines america has declared red lines about iran and certainly it's it's not encouraging to say uh not a sure-footed response by America, should we say, to the what seems to be the use of chemical weapons by the regime. The regime has control of its chemical weapons. My, my view is that it, it, it's by far more likely that it was the regime that used these weapons than the rebels. Uh, the rebels, we don't seem to know that they have the capability to access, remove, and then use chemical weapons. So 
But Obama's asked for some days, he's asked for some time, and, and then he will have to respond. He's under a lot of pressure domestically from the Republican Party mm. to respond decisively to this. And um, I think humanitarians the world over would demand that not just America, but the international community respond with more determination to the Syrian conflict than it has so far. The refugee problem, the escalating violence, the deaths, which now we must at some point move from 70,000 to, to a larger number, I think, if we're going to be realistic about how many people have died in this conflict. And the international community does have a responsibility. And I think the Syrian people have a right to expect the international community to protect them. One of the reasons the West is going to lose out in the post-Assad settlement is that we have not shown clearly that we support them and we support their right not to be slaughtered by the regime. Other forces have moved in far more energetically and at the moment they will be better placed to take advantage of the political settlement afterwards. The West needs to get a move on here. And if the West doesn't get a move on, so, I mean, uh, Britain and uh, the European Union are looking to the Obama administration for leadership because the United States has the military and the di ep diplomatic capabilities to uh, not resolve the conflict, but certainly bring it to an end. Um, what are the implications in terms of Obama saying last August that there are clear red lines that the regime should not use chemical or biological weapons against its own people? And now we're finding reports that the regime has. Um, and if we see a, a non-active -act response on behalf of the Obama administration, won't this erode America's authority and power, not only in the Middle East, but in the region as well, which then could result in other rogue regimes using chemical or biological weapons against their own people or against um, those that they oppose uh, without uh, any cost of reprisal or punishment? I think you're right. I think the difficulty that the West as a whole, including America, is working through is this one. The conflict in Syria is, it has some elements which are comparable to events we saw in Egypt and so on. A dictator who was loathed, the people want their freedom. There's certainly an element of that. There's something different about the Syrian conflict, though, a few things that are different. One is, this isn't really a, a conflict of the risen people against the the autocratic regime which rests solely on the military. The Alawite regime rests also upon various minority groups, including Christians, who really don't look ahead to an Islamist Syria with, with, um, with great thoughts. Some of the business community also. His regime is reasonably intact in terms of the Fourth Armored Division, the Republican Guards, the Special Forces, and the Irregulars, which your, your clip talked about. He's, as I say, he's not going anywhere soon. That tells us something about what any intervention would face, which is it would have to fight its way in, and it would be fighting its way in into a civil war situation in which external actors, Russia, China, the Gulf states and others, are not always well motivated and wouldn't always be well disposed towards those Western forces mm -hmm. and would have some strategic interest in tying those Western forces down. So that's a difficulty. Similarly, another diff difference is that the Syrian regime has reasonably intact um, air defense systems. Now, so people talk about establishing a no-fly zone, which is certainly one of the possibilities that could be looked at. So a no-fly zone in which people could flee to, they could be, they could be cared for there. A no-fly no zone in which uh, over the Kurdish region and progressively over the regions in which the rebels have, have seized control. That's a possibility. But people shouldn't be under the illusion that that's an easy thing for the West to achieve. It would face a lot of uh, opposition on the ground from Syrian air defense systems and so on. Similarly, boots on the ground, I just don't see it politically. We're still in the aftermath period of the Afghanistan and the Iraqi wars. We're not even out of Afghanistan fully yet. We're only just out of Iraq. They were deeply unpopular conflicts. And politically, it's, it's unlikely, I would say, that an American, uh, American administration or, or European states are likely to entertain that kind of possibility. There are other options which could be looked at, including, as I say, the establishment of no-fly zones, the use of special forces, and also clear diplomatic and political uh, warnings given to the Assad regime, uh, which could be effective.
Yeah, and one of the suggestions has been to actually arm the rebel forces like uh, the British and the French did um, in Libya against uh, Colonel Gaddafi. But uh, I think it's only today that uh, Michael Oren, uh, Israel's ambassador to the United States, in an interview on CNN, said we have to be very, very careful about which rebel forces we actually arm and who we arm because Israel fears that uh, in a post-Assad um, uh, Islamist state would emerge in Syria backed up with Western missiles and weapons and capabilities. Yeah, I agree. Uh, l let me tell you a story and answer to this question. I saw a YouTube clip just a few days ago, which was um, of the gravestones of the British Eighth Army Second World War fighters who fought off Rommel and the Nazis in North Africa. And my dad was in the Eighth Army. That's the battle he went through. And on this clip, which you can watch on YouTube, the Islamists who we helped to power in Libya are systematically smashing the gravestones of those British soldiers, Christian and Jewish, by the way, because the, the camera focuses upon the Star of David on some of the stones and, and not on others. And they're smashing them up. It's distressing scenes to see for, for anyone. There is a real dilemma, which is that if we supply lethal weaponry to Islamist forces, we could find ourselves facing that lethal weaponry in time, the West and Israel. That's a real concern. So I think you know, loose talk about simply funding the opposition, really, uh, Michael Oren is right, it really needs to be tempered by some, some careful consideration about what kind of weaponry is given to what kind of forces and what the consequences will be for the West in time. Having said that, it's a dilemma because as the other forces pile in and supply their, their militias and we're hesitant, then we suffer a political cost later in terms of who's in, who's in place and in power to shape the post-Assad regime. These, these are excruciating dilemmas for foreign ministries in, Amer in America and, and in Europe. Yeah, can I quote something from uh, Israel's uh, deputy uh, foreign minister that was in the uh, Times this week, uh, Zevi uh, Elkin, the uh, deputy Israeli uh, foreign minister, has urged the international community to take control of a serious chemical and uh, biological weapons arsenal. He says American hesitancy on uh, the Syrian issue over the last few days is causing a great deal of worry in Israel. An Israeli army radio said yesterday, says that if Obama does not respect the red lines that he himself set out and does not intervene uh, when Bashar al-Assad uses chemical weapons against civilians, it is showing weakness and it will cost dearly later in Syria, but also in the Iranian nuclear question. And, and, and surely this is something that Israel is concerned about the most, which you alluded to earlier in the program, um, Alan, that what Israel is concerned about is if Obama says these are red lines and they're not red lines, does this mean that the same situation that applies to Syria would also then apply to Iran's nuclear program? And if Iran gets nuclear weapons, in which Obama said there were clear red lines that he will not allow them to develop nuclear weapons, then uh, really he's uh, eroding his power base. And, and of course, the situation for Israel becomes more deadly and dangerous by the minute. I think Steve Elkin is right that there needs to be a robust international uh, response to this. Uh, absolutely. What we know is that America's forward planning has already involved its sending military forces to Jordan where it's training alongside Jordanian forces for a possible emergency entry into Syria to seize loosed chemical weapon supplies to secure bases and so on. There are difficulties. The difficulties in seizing and controlling and then taking out of the country chemical weapon stores is that chemical weapon stores tend to be, have two qualities. One, they move. We're not talking about large-scale fixed sites. We're talking about, by and large, move, both in terms of production facilities and in storage facilities. We're talking about something that can move around. So that, that's, that's one difficulty. Um, there are other difficulties in terms of seizing these um, stores, which are that they're usually held in very remote areas, <laughs> and you've got to go across tracts of land to reach them, tracts of land which are currently occupied by uh, forces which are engaged in conflict with each other. I'm not saying for a moment it shouldn't be done or can't be done. I'm saying there's, a, there's I think the international community in part is looking for any option other than uh, moving in with military force on the ground to seize these, these stores. So that's some of the hesitancy is behind that. Now, the concern with, with that on, on amongst the, the range of actors, including Israel, is that do America's lines 
red lines really count. So, you know, there's skepticism around. America, not this administration, but previous, said it would prevent Pakistan gaining a nuclear weapon. Pakistan then gained a nuclear weapon. It said it would stop North Korea gaining a nuclear weapon. It looks very much as if that boat has sailed too, and North Korea has gained a nuclear weapon. And now the international community in America is saying we won't allow Iran to gain a nuclear weapon. There's two ways to look at this. On the one hand, people say, look, American presidents don't bluff. This is what Joe Biden said when he spoke at the AIPAC conference recently. Trust us, we don't bluff. This president isn't bluffing. We know that when um, Ehud Barak, uh, is Israel's previous defense minister, went to D.C. in late, in late autumn of 2012, we know that he was sat down and shown detailed planning by American military planners for American strikes should they be necessary on Iran. That was one of the reasons Israel was able to slightly step back and say, we can give you more time. We know that in the four and a half hour closed door policy summit between Obama and Netanyahu on President Obama's recent trip to Israel, it wasn't just symbolism. There's a lot of symbolism and, and creating a new, um, pressing an emotional reset, I think, between the two countries, which was important. It was also a policy summit. And in that policy summit, I think President Obama said, we have your back. This is something we're going to do. We have not moved from a position of um, prevention to containment. We, we're not moving to a position of we'll accept them, Iran with the bomb, and we'll simply contain that threat. America is still on the ground of prevention. However, if um, what Israel would like to see is a couple of things. Israel would like to see a timeline. So when does America feel Iran is moving past its red line? And it would like to see some more publicly stated consequences so that the Iranian regime is fully aware that America absolutely intends to strike. Israel's fear is this, that the international community is going to end up saying, it's too early, it's too early, it's too early, it's too late. <laughs> that Iran is playing a very clever game, which is inching its way towards both America and Israel's red line, but not going over, positioning itself with all the capabilities it needs for when the political situation is right, it makes a dash for the bomb at that point, and it's too late to stop. Israel's position is the one bit of the program we can see, we know where it is, it's stationary and we can strike it, is the, nuclear, the, is the uranium enrichment program, and also the plutonium track, which is equally important. Is Israel's red line is where it is, I think sensibly, because it's saying we can't really target the, the, the weaponization program, and we can't really target the intercontinental ballistic missile part of the program. The bit mm. we know and can target is the enrichment. Iran is going full steam ahead with the most advanced um, uranium enrichment centrifuges. It's installing more and more. Its latent capacity to produce the bomb is getting greater and greater. And in recent weeks, Israelis have made it clear, as far as they're concerned, you know, they don't really have that full year and more to, to, to wait on this. It, it could still be something that, you know, if the sanctions fail, if the diplomacy fails, we could have to go to a situation in which you know, other options are, are considered. Which is, which is uh, extremely dangerous. But going back to the um, Syrian crisis now, um, Alan, isn't there great concern uh, the, that Europe has, that Britain has, that uh, many of the foreign jihadists that uh, are, are making their way to Syria and joining up with the opposition forces against uh, President al-Assad are young, um, impressionable British and European Muslims that have been radicalized and uh, now have a jihadic experience, a military experience, could pose a, danger, a dangerous terrorist threat to uh, Britain and Europe in the future. Yes, this is a real concern, isn't it? There's been some reports about this recently, and it's undoubtedly taking place. Uh, we have proof of this. And it's, it's yet another conflict in which European, young European Muslims who've been radicalized take themselves off to, to fight. So it's, it's Kashmir, Chechnya have been other conflicts in which it's partly young men seeking the adventure of warfare. I think we have to say that. But it's also partly young men who have been radicalized by Islamist recruiters in the West. For far too long in the West, we were very complacent about this. We took a very odd view, I think, of multiculturalism, which was everyone can do whatever they want and no one can judge anybody. And that really gave a, a free uh, play to a lot of Islamist organizations and recruiters to, to move amongst the Muslim community and really create havoc. Um, 
Part of the result of that is radicalization, and from radicalization we get young men taking themselves off to fight. Sometimes they come back with skills and with experience, and they're tempered and hardened, and they create difficult um, threats for us back here in the West. That's absolutely true. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now that's entitled um, Rebel Rise, EU-born jihadists flock to Syria to uh, fight Assad. Well, uh, the EU's anti-terror chief is sounding the alarm over the number of young Europeans going off to the Syrian war. Hundreds of volunteers are already fighting alongside rebels and could pose a serious security threat when they return home. That's according to at least one official. Uh, Auntie's Tessa Arcilia now reports that Europe is increasingly worried about the terror threat gr uh, brewing from within. Syria's two-year-old conflict has already seen spillovers to neighboring countries, but now it has extended far beyond that. It's estimated that hundreds of Europeans from 14 countries, mostly young men, have joined the rebels in Syria in fighting against Bashar al-Assad. London-based International Center for the Study of Radicalization put the top figure at 600. Well, here in Antwerp, Belgium, the media coverage on the radicalization of young people has recently focused on one specific story, that of a father in search of his son. Now, Dimitri Bondik's son had joined a radical Islamist group and had gone to Syria to join the fight. But the father had gone all the way there, hoping to bring his son back. Planes are flying overhead all the time. When we are on the street or inside a building, we hope a bomb won't drop on us. I haven't had contact with Ye Yoon, but we assume he's here in Aleppo. We spoke with Dimitri's lawyer, who's in constant contact with him, and he says the father is hell-bent on finding his 18-year-old son, Ye Yoon. We don't expect that uh, Belgium will send uh, an army to Syria. I think that's, that's clear. So that's also why um, Dimitri Bonting was, um, was eager to go himself. He, he said, I want to do something for my son. A son who started changing about three years ago. The problem with Yoon was that uh, at a certain moment he uh, was influenced by some radicalists and he made contact with some people on the street and uh, there was also a story about uh, an, an untold love. Eh? He, had, he had a girlfriend and it didn't, it didn't work out and there were some friends that say, OK, come with us. And very slowly it started that he was really influenced and really brainwashed, uh, that, that are the words of my client. He grew a beard and um, uh, he started wearing other clothes, um, preaching for every five times a day, things like that. So it was a little bit awkward for, for a son of 15, 16 years old. So he was really under the influence of, of, a radical, uh, of radical people. This group Yeun had come into contact with is Sharia for Belgium, a radical Islamist group whose leader, Faoud Belkacem, had been arrested for hate speech and calls justifying the use of violence. Oh, there is judgment day. If, you, uh, if you're a Muslim, you will, uh, you will go to paradise. If you're a disbeliever, you, you will go to hell. Terrorism expert Claude Moniquet says the rise in radicalized youth is alarming, many of whom are easy prey. The first question is why they convert. And usually they don't convert to, to, to make jet. They convert because they have a problem at one moment in their life. Most of them have no clear political ideas. They go to fight because of the fight. And their goal is the fight. If they, will, they don't meet a Muslim who convince them, uh, they could be in a sect. They could they are trapped in the net of people who are there just for accreditating them and for uh, convincing them that to be a good Muslim, they want to go to Syria, to Sahel, or, or to commit an attack, terrorist attack here. Authorities are paying even closer attention, with alert levels heightened, while worried family members of some youth fighting in Syria have been calling for a clampdown on radical groups the best they can do, short of going to Syria themselves. Although that may not be completely out of the question. Tessar Celia RT, Antwerp in Belgium.
Welcome back to the Middle East Report, and that was a, an extremely uh, disturbing report uh, as uh, many uh, young and impressionable uh, European and British Muslims are joining up with jihadist forces and uh, fighting against the regime in Syria. Uh, Alan, what are the implications um, for once this conflict's over that uh, these radicalised young Muslim youths um, that from Britain, also from Europe as well, come back and join up with um, terrorist organisations here in Europe. Doesn't this pose a direct threat not only to British security but also to European security? There's no doubt that radicalised um, young Muslims who have this kind of military experience pose a threat. Absolutely. To put it in a slightly bigger picture, I did some work with the British Home Office for a couple of years looking at young British Muslims who got themselves into radical networks and then got themselves out again. And we tried to learn some lessons from their experiences. One of the things I would say is, this is slightly the good news part of this story, is that we always have to remember we're talking about a minority of a minority of a minority. We're talking about slithers, really, of the Muslim community in the UK. Um, the bigger picture is reasonably encouraging in terms of people involving themselves in professions and politics and integrating into British life. So that's, that's, that's what we've got going for us. Having said that, slithers of people can create absolute mayhem and death on a large scale if they get their hands on the right kind of uh, equipment and so on, as we saw in Boston just, um, just recently. So it's a genuine threat. What, what we're seeing is that clip was, was really great to see because often we don't see how the radicalization takes place. And I really, I thought your clip was fantastic to show your viewers because that's how it actually happens. Small groups of people looking towards a guru-like figure. And I thought your uh, expert was, was spot on as well. My research showed exactly the same, which is that these are vulnerable individuals. Their vulnerability can come from experiences of racism. It can come from an identity crisis, for instance, in Britain, I'm told I'm a Pakistani. In Pakistan, I'm told I'm British. I don't really seem to be able to put my feet down firmly anywhere. Who am I? Vulnerability of various kinds. Also, spiritual seeking can be part of the vulnerability. Imams who can't speak English, who can't explain the relationship between their faith and the lives that they're leading, who are incompetent. So they go to bright, smart, charismatic figures who say, look, I can explain your vulnerability. It's not to do with you, it's to do with the West. It's not to do with you, it's to do with the infidels. Your solution, I also have for you, it's to do with Islam and Islamism. In other words, the particular politicized, ideologized, kind of distorted version of Islam which the Islamist preachers will give, and they draw them into that. So they give them a frame of reference for the world, and then they also separate them progressively from their families. Don't do this, don't see that person, only relate to us. And when they've got them separate, and in that world filled with their ideas, they can then suggest um, violent actions to them, and that's, that's certainly the pattern. Well, uh, we're sadly down to the last uh, two minutes of the program, Alan. Um, mm. I have to get you back on another program because there's certainly a lot more issues that we need to explore. Um, but just very, very quickly in about a minute and a half, um, what can be done to really help solve this bloody civil war in Syria that's cost so many lives and has serious regional ramifications for peace and security in the region? I think there's two levels. There's the humanitarian level and there's the political and diplomatic level. I think at the humanitarian level, certainly the international community should be doing far more than it's doing now to make the position of these million, million and a half refugees tolerable in the countries to which they've gone. And that does mean significant sums of money being transferred to, to those countries through UN agencies so it can be tracked and controlled and so on and be transparent. However it gets there, it really has to get there very quickly. I think diplomatically, there needs to be a far more robust response from the United Nations, including Russia and China, not for military intervention, but to say absolutely clearly to the Syrian regime it cannot engage in the use of chemical weapons, that it's a red line not just for America, but for the international community as a whole. We have a duty to protect uh, those citizens. So that diplomatic push should be made. On the military side, we've talked about the dilemmas. Having said that, I think any kind of regular use of chemical weapons. If we see a repetition of this, then I think there's really no choice. I'm not a military man, so I'm not going to sit here and spin out a scenario for you for how the military invention could take place. We have a lot of weaponry and it should be done. Alan, I just want to thank you so much for being uh, my special guest today on the Middle East Report. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for watching today's program. As we can see, the uh, crisis in uh, Syria is not going to stop anytime soon. So it's important that we raise awareness about what's happening in Syria, that we speak out, 
and uh, that we do all we can to help uh, protect those uh, vulnerable Christians caught up in this conflict, but also ensure that uh, America's authority is, is not lost, particularly as Obama's called for red lines against the regime using chemical, biological weapons. And uh, most of all, we need to protect Israel's border from this conflict. And so I want to thank you for watching today's special on the crisis in Syria. Lies for justice to open her closed eyes and come a crashing.